Hi, this is your Russian Rulers podcast host, Mark Schaus. I'm interrupting today's podcast all the way from episode 108 to make a short announcement. I've created a new blog site for all things having to do with Russian history and far beyond just the rulers. You can find it at www.RussianRulersHistory.com. I mean, there's a lot of content there already to read about things like the Decemberist Revolt of 1825, the life of Sviatopolk the Accursed, Nikita Khrushchev, and much, much more. Of course, there's also a small little PayPal donation button there if you want to help support the podcast. It would be much appreciated. Now, on to the podcast. Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, episode number 24, The Dawn of the Romanov Dynasty. Last week, we saw the rise and fall of Boris Gudunov and Russia's plunge into the horrors that was the time of troubles. While the period ended in 1613 historically, all was not well within Russia, but it did come out of the period with important changes to society, some good, some bad. Winners coming out of the time of troubles included the service gentry, who gained a lot of power, while the boyars lost most of theirs. The church came out way ahead because of its ability to rally the people. But the institution that came of this period with the greatest gain was the autocracy and the position of the Tsar. The peasants, though, were the biggest losers, as they were now vassals of the land, bound by law to toil for whomever owned the land. Additionally, the children of the serfs, as they were now called, were also bound to the land as well. Serfdom became firmly ingrained into Russian society until its abolition beginning in 1803 by Tsar Alexander I. In February of 1613, a Zemsky Sabor was formed to choose a new Tsar. It was generally agreed that this had to be done in order to secure and protect Russia's future. A dynasty to replace the Rurikid one was also critical. Pretenders to the throne, as we have seen, was disastrous to the country, and by creating a strong dynasty, they could avoid this. But who would take such a job when Russia's existence was still in doubt? A number of candidates were brought forth and often heated discussions, like the hero of the moment, Prince Dmitry Pozarsky. But the gathering of members of all walks of life in Russia settled on one person, a boy of 16 years of age, one Michael Romanov. The historian Kostomarov notes that, quote, few examples can be found in history when a new sovereign ascended the throne in conditions so extremely sad as those in which Mikhail Fyodorovich, a minor, was elected. The country was broke, cities in ruins, bands of thugs roamed the countryside, and there was still war with Poland and Sweden. Why would anyone want to take over as Tsar in these conditions? Certainly not Michael Romanov. When first told of his election as Tsar, he and his mother flatly refused the offer. We have no written information on his reasoning, but it takes little imagination to figure out why. The recent Tsars had disastrous reigns, some ending in their murder. Over and over, the group sent by the Zemsky Sabor begged him to take charge and assume the role of ruler of all Russia, which he eventually and grudgingly did. So why was this young boy chosen? Well, in order to find a suitable person that the people would buy into, they needed someone with a connection to the old line, and the Romanovs had it through Ivan IV's first wife, Anastasia. Also, the Boyar elite needed someone who could be easily controlled, which made Michael an ideal choice, as he was considered somewhat simple-minded, or as Dutch envoy Isaac Massa noted, he doubted the boy was even literate. Nonetheless, in mid-March 1613, Michael and his mother headed off from the Apatyev Monastery and headed towards Moscow. The journey, hampered by a wet spring, took 42 days for them to reach the capital. But on July 11, 1613, Michael was crowned Great Sovereign Tsar at the Church of the Assumption of the Mother of God in the Kremlin. In 1547, this was the place that Ivan IV was crowned. But power was his in name only as a boyar consul was really in charge under the name of the Assembly of the Land. 
For the next few years, they ruled Russia, trying to solve the numerous problems besetting the nation. Then, in 1619, Michael's father, Metropolitan Filaret, returned from captivity in Poland. He was then given the title of Veliki Gozudar, or Great Sovereign. This shows that Michael had little real power, as the title of Veliki Gozudar was generally reserved for the Tsar alone. My Russian history professor, Dr. Paul Average, used to tell us that Tsar Michael also had kind of a fetish about playing with clocks, and he was terribly simple-minded. While the church believes to this day that Michael was really a deeply pious man, so much so that they made him a saint many years after his death. To be honest, talking about Tsar Michael and his times is difficult, as much of what we know about him has come down from the chroniclers, who had a very subjective and obviously pro-Romanov slant on things. We also have some foreign reports about him and his court, but Russia was viewed as almost being alien to them, and they had very judgmental air to their writings. In order to deal with this gap in knowledge, I'll try to explain how Michael's reign set things up for future Romanovs, which allowed them to stay in power for so long, and how this actually set up Nicholas II to fail so horribly, and why he could not imagine what was happening at the end. What Michael had stepped into, along with his father, Metropolitan Filaret, was a country which was greatly depopulated due to the Great Famine, going from 12 million people when Fyodor I died to 7 or 8 million when Michael was crowned Tsar. It wasn't until 1678 did Russia reach the pre-Time of Troubles population. A number of depopulating, which you might call burps, came between 1613 and 1678, including a devastating outbreak of the plague in 1654, and the Polish War of 1654 to 1657. Given these events, it is amazing that the population grew so quickly during the Romanov's first reign. While a number of misfortunes struck the first Romanov's reign, there was an improved distribution and production system for food, and with fewer people came more economic opportunities. But there was a problem in the early 17th century, as most of the gentry and nobility really saw no need to grow their businesses or to improve the efficiency of their farms. They were all self-sustaining, and they tended to hold on to their wealth, with no incentive to expand trade. It is here that Michael's government increased taxes on boyars, gentry, and merchant classes, not as an economic stimulus, but because the government was broke. But what they found out is by increasing taxes, they actually forced an increase of trade and an increase in food production to pay for the taxes. The peasants, although turning more and more into slaves, at least were eating better. And the Romanovs and their advisors made sure that everyone knew who made it possible. Tsar Michael. From this came the belief that the Tsar was the Batushka, or little father, whom the Narod, or common people, believed always looked out for them. The belief permeated throughout that if things were bad, we could just get to the Tsar, and past his wicked advisors, he would make everything right. This idealization of the Romanov Tsars was perpetrated, sometimes rightly, sometimes falsely, for over 300 years, until Nicholas II lost sight of this relationship between him and the Narod, so much so that in the early 1900s, the peasants began to lose faith in their father, their Batushka. The economy was still in tatters, and more revenue was needed in the state coffers, and it began to arrive starting in Michael's reign from the east, from the vast lands of Siberia. Its colonization began under the reign of Ivan IV, and further encouraged under Boris Gudunov. The wealthiest family in Russia, the Stroganovs, exploited this land, going at it alone at first, then with some minimal help from Moscow. First came the furs that were to adorn the robes of the kings and queens of Europe and China, then the salt, iron, fish, and walrus tusks. Gold was in the hills to be exploited years later, along with oil, whose uses were many years in the future. Cossacks were one of the few groups that were hardy enough to make the voyage to Siberia. One Simeon Dezhnev left us writings, which gives us an insight into their trials and tribulations, as well as how they made their money for themselves and Mother Russia. Here he talks about a tribe he came upon, known as the Yukagirs. Quote, We captured two of them in a fight, in which I was badly wounded. We took tribute from them by name, recording in the tribute books, 
what we took from each and what was for the sovereign Tsar's tribute. I wanted to take more, but they said, We have no sables, for we do not live in the forest. But the reindeer people visit us, and when they come, we shall buy sables from them and pay tribute to the sovereign. Next was a letter to the Siberian office asking for payments owed to him, which shows the difficulties of life in Siberia. Quote, I, your slave, supported myself on your service and on the new rivers with my own money and my own equipment, and I received no official pay in money, grain and salt, from 1642 to 1661, because of the shortage of money and grain. I risked my head in your service, was severely wounded, shed my blood, suffered great cold and hunger, and all but died of starvation. I was impoverished by shipwreck, incurred heavy debts, and finally ruined. Sovereign, have mercy, please. Now, one thing I'd like to interject about the Russian people, which is quite proudful for me, is that in many of the writings we see a people that easily accepts other different peoples into the Russian fold. Asian or Slavic, dark-skinned or light, it didn't seem to matter. They accepted many diverse peoples into the fold, like the Romans did during their growth, but unlike America, which has had such a hard time accepting people different from the majority. The greatness that enveloped Russia can be seen in the embracing and acceptance of the diversity of peoples. An example can be seen in a policy statement made to the governor of Irkutsk. Quote, the sovereign Tsar has ordered that tribute-paying native people always be treated with consideration, that they suffer no violence, losses, extortions, or impositions, and that they should live in peace without fear, pursuing their occupations, and serve the sovereign Tsar and wish him well. Servicemen are ordered to bring men of newly discovered lands who do not yet pay tribute under the exalted arm of the sovereign Tsar, but in a kindly, not a violent manner. While this grand and vast land had amazing riches, its administration was a nightmare. It took two years to reach the town of Yakutsk from Moscow, so poor Dezhnev's plea took years to respond to, which I might add was positive. Michael's advisors now needed to shore up the military to meet the threats from external enemies. They began to bring in foreign mercenary leaders to modernize the army. Men like Alexander Daniels, Walter Ert, and Patrick Gordon decided to join up together with the Russians and provided invaluable advice, helping them to become less vulnerable and more able to defend itself as well as becoming more expansive in the future. We now go back to 1618, when the Poles, led by Prince Vyadislav, who still held out hope to his claims to the Russian throne, invaded Russia and made it to the gates of Moscow, where it was forcefully stopped. This is where the Russians gained the release of Michael's father, Filaret, in return for a peace treaty. The treaty seemed very one-sided in favor of the Poles, as they gave up little, just a few uh, people like Filaret that they had held. And they gained territory in the West, but what it did was give Russia time to rebuild and allow them to strengthen. Had the Poles or the Swedes pressed the issue and continued their attacks, or if the Tartars had taken up arms, Russia would have likely crumbled. It is said to never let a beaten tiger heal. The enemies of Russia allowed the injured tiger to not only heal, but get stronger than ever. Now, Michael's army did try to attack Poland twice more during his reign and failed both times. Still, it weakened Poland enough and cost them so much financially that Vyadislav gave up his claim to the throne. Fortunately, in 1633, Michael's father, Metropolitan Filaret, died, so now Michael was the sole Veliki Gozyodar. In 1634, Michael did something to take away all chance of freedom for the millions of peasants. He strengthened the institution of serfdom. He did this by extending the time a landowner could reclaim a serf from five years to ten, and then in 1642, he extended it to fifteen years. Boris Gudunov had originally set the time to reclaim a serf at five years, which began the era of serfdom, but it was under Michael that the serf truly became a slave. This ended any serf's dream of improving his or her or their children's life for the next 250 years. In 1642, the Don Cossacks rose up and gave Russia an opportunity for a much sought-after warm-water port by taking the Turkish fort of Azov near the Black Sea by force. 
They begged Michael to help fortify their hold on a city, but the Tsar's advisors thought better of going to war with the more powerful and resourceful Turks at this point, and ordered the Cossacks to abandon the city. In July 1645, Michael died, leaving his throne to his 16-year-old son, Alexis. The first Romanov's reign, while not a resounding success, did help Russia heal itself after the time of troubles and began the climb up the ranks of nations. Next week, we look into the lives of Alexis and his son, Fyodor III, as well as the beginnings of the reign of Regent Sophia and the two co-ruling Tsars, Ivan and his young brother, the boy known to his peers as Peter I, and to history as Peter the Great. Now, for this week in Russian history for the week of October 10th through the 16th. In 1791, Grigory Alexandrovich Potemkin, Russian general and statesman, dies. In 1875, Alexei Konstantinovich Tolstoy, Russian novelist, poet, and dramatist, died. In 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis began. A U.S. Air Force U-2 reconnaissance plane and its pilot fly over the island of Cuba and take photographs of Soviet missiles capable of carrying nuclear warheads being installed and erected in Cuba. In 1964, the Soviet Union launched the Voskhod-1 into Earth orbit as the first spacecraft with a multi-person crew and the first flight without spacesuits. In 1964 also, Leonid Brezhnev became the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and thereby becomes, along with his allies such as Alexei Kosygin, the leader of the Soviet Socialist Republics, ousting the former monolithic leader Nikita Khrushchev and sending him into retirement as a non-person in the USSR. In 1986, U.S. President Ronald Reagan and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev met in Reykjavik, Iceland, in an effort to continue discussions about scaling back their intermediate missile arsenals in Europe. And in 1990, Soviet Union leader Mikhail Gorbachev is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to lessen gold, Cold War tensions and open up his nation. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to visit the iTunes App Store and download the Russian Rulers app. And please, visit the websites at russianrulers.podhoster.com. Become a Facebook friend at Russian Rulers History Podcast. Ask a question, make a suggestion, and please leave a comment. And as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.